This is an all too familiar image. And for most people, this is the first thing that people see uh, when a natural disaster occurs. They see news footage of catastrophic damage, displaced families, and, and lives changed forever. But you guys in this room, most of you know that this is just the beginning or the end of a year-long effort for your agency to be prepared to respond to, to disasters like this. And the Red Cross is no different. The Red Cross operates across the entire disaster cycle in preparedness. Uh, we're installing smoke alarms in our neighborhoods, uh, working in our schools with students to teach them escape planning in their homes, um, and also about different types of uh, first aid tactics and things like that to help their families as well. In response, major disaster relief operations were providing shelter and feeding and comfort through health services and disaster mental health contacts. And we're also responding to every home fire in the United States, uh, over 65,000 a year of those. And then in recovery, we are providing financial assistance and we're also connecting the clients that we serve uh, to different resources within the communities to allow them to get back to their lives more quickly. Last year in response, uh, we served uh, 8.2 million meals and snacks, had over 290,000 shelter stays, delivered 2.2 million relief items, cleanup kits, bulk water distribution, and over 188,000 health services and mental health services contacts. How do we do that? Well, we have an enormous volunteer disaster workforce, over 40,000 volunteers. We're 95% volunteer organization. Once you hear the scope and scale of kind of what our operation, our organization looks like, you can understand why we would want to find a way to uh, make our communication more efficient, to provide better data to the people in the field, uh, to national headquarters, Early on in a relief operation, as most of you are aware, uh, information is inaccurate, it's spotty, uh, it's hard to come by. Uh, in the past, it was based on personal relationships. I pick up the phone and call my emergency management partners uh, in whatever jurisdiction I'm in and say, hey, what's going on over there? And that was the best we could do. We made the best decisions we could, but operational information is very fluid to begin with. So any efficiency that you can create in those early days really makes a huge difference in the way that the operation unfolds. So ultimately, we wanted to find a way out of our manual processes, our spreadsheets, our post-it notes, our scratch paper, and find a way into a more streamlined approach that we could share across the organization from top to bottom and all the way across the country. Some tools that we have available uh, that we're beginning to deploy are like this shelter uh, summary dashboard. Uh, our national sheltering system in partnership with FEMA uh, will allow us to consolidate digital data uh, and provide a situational operational picture that we haven't had before uh, in the realm of sheltering, both uh, as you can see here about open shelters and counts, but also with electronic client registration. So for the first time we will have demographic information. Uh, we'll have information about the barriers for those folks to get home so we can provide the resources necessary to get them out of the shelters more quickly. Another example of shelter data is this map here. Um, you can see the green circles uh, are our open shelters and the capacity is in green. Uh, the current population is in red, so you can quickly tell uh, what your population versus capacity kind of situation is. We can uh, proactively create uh, or open new shelters uh, or uh, if we're getting to the point where we're towards the end of the operation, we have a better idea of when we can close shelters. Provides an aggregate at the top of the open shelters and the population. And also on the right side, you can see some specific details about each shelter uh, and what the location, uh, the capacity and populations are of the individual shelters as well. Another example of the tools that we're able to use is around damage assessment. Uh, this particular map uh, gives you a quick idea of of the different uh, damage assessments and the, the structures and the homes in the area that we're responding to. Uh, we collect that data 
I use an RC Collect, which is a, a version of Survey123 that's been branded for the Red Cross. Uh, so we have that in the hands of every responder that goes to an operation. If they pass a house, they see damage, uh, they can quickly fill out the survey, and the information is shown real time here. You can click on individual homes and see detailed information about what type of structure there is there, what kind of damage, uh, who assessed the home, if you need to do follow-up or anything like that. Then it also zooms in and changes the demographics and the information on the left side uh, to match that zoomed in image as well. So you can uh, just have a specific scope and control of a, a specific district. If you've divided your operation up, uh, you can kind of focus in where you need to focus. Imitation is the highest form of flattery. It was really good. I'm so glad that uh, that's been brought up a couple of times uh, because we've flattered the heck out of NIPSIG uh, last year uh, in the use of their crowdsourced data layers. Uh, this is an enormous leap forward for us in situational awareness. As I mentioned before, uh, early on in the response operation, you might not have the data you need. Uh, in a lot of cases, we're not able to get into the theater of operations to get the data that we need. So to have something like this that's a crowdsourced source of photos from folks that are already there, that live there, uh, that work there, that are public safety there, gives us eyes on the ground that we wouldn't otherwise have. And you can see by the pictures here, now, they're very impactful and, and a quick understanding of kind of what we're up against before we even get there. Uh, but it uh, gives us a great resource uh, to kind of zoom into a particular area, understand the unique situation, the unique uh, things that are going on in that little small area that we might need to access or not be able to access yet. Uh, also able to, uh, to share that information with our partners too. Ultimately, wanted to talk about other ways that we've been innovating with the tools uh, this was in response to uh, Hurricane Irma and Maria on Puerto Rico. Uh, and as of those of you know that were involved in that operation, uh, the infrastructure was devastated. Uh, there was no driving around the island uh, to assess need. It just wasn't going to happen. It didn't happen for months in some places. So uh, again, using Survey123, we were able to empower uh, people in the communities, uh, public safety workers, uh, residents, community leaders, elected officials, to let us know what they needed. So we created a survey, distributed the survey to the, the localities, and came up with this situational awareness map. We were able to find out which areas had electricity, which areas needed water, which areas needed food, and we could continually track that through the operation so that as we met that need, we knew that we could face our resources in a different area. Specifically, and especially with an island job, you know that uh, shipping and resourcing that operation is a unique challenge. So the more efficient those shipping uh, instances can be and the resources that you're putting in the places, the more accurate it can be with that. Um, you can save days or weeks uh, in the delivery of those supplies to that particular area. So since we were innovating, and since we were starting to understand a little better our situational awareness internally, the next step logically would be uh, for us to start sharing that with our partners. And that evolved into our partner brief. This one is from Hurricane Michael, and you can see uh, kind of an overall situational awareness picture. Again, us uh, flattering other partners that have created layers for weather and precipitation. Thank you very much for those. Along with our data that we've collected, uh, about the response operations that we're currently responding to, giving specific details, understanding uh, what kind of precipitation is coming to that area. So we have open shelters and flooding. We know when that's going to get worse and in what ways that might get worse. It allows us to prepare a little bit better. You can see also in the top left uh, some of the major flood stage river gauges as well uh, in this particular map. The next iteration of partner sharing uh, is our partner hub. This is a, a product that we're developing now in conjunction with our operational partners. There's a couple of reasons for this. One, there's a lot of operational partners uh, that operate in the same area, and anytime we can deduplicate our efforts, uh, we're all gonna serve clients better. So this provides a common operating picture not only within the Red Cross, but across the sector in disaster response. It also gives us the opportunity to bring GIS tools 
to a larger audience. Organizations that may not have been exposed to GIS tools before or may uh, not have the resources to provide those GIS tools at this time, they can find a way to do that through our portal as well. Uh, but it also allows us to gain data and share data back around things like sheltering, feeding, and damage assessment, uh, which are critical to the case management and case work that, that all of our partners do, uh, and also to provide the best locations for feeding, fixed feeding, and also mobile feeding sites. We also have some tools available to us that allow us to interact with our elected officials more effectively so that we can provide an accurate picture of what our service delivery has been in a particular area uh, that that elected official has responsibility for. Data. Who in here works with data? I mean, yeah, I know it's a ridiculous question because you wouldn't be here if you didn't, right? How many of you can interact with data and look at data without doing any manual manipulation of that data? Anybody? I see zero hands up right now. We recognize that we have the same problem. We all have that same problem. We talk about our data structure. We talk about the way that we house data and that we use data. Uh, we don't talk about the dirty little secrets of manual manipulation of extraction and reloading and putting into different systems uh, and those types of things. Ultimately, for us to continue to be able to innovate and for us to continue to be able to progress in our use of GIS tools and specifically our RC View tool, we've got to get our data in line. The representation on the right is not what I'm getting ready to talk about. The representation on the left is a representation of our current data picture. Looks like a spider web. Uh, and a lot of the different lines between the systems of record that you see there uh, have people on them. Uh, where we have to extract the data, we've got to manipulate the data, we've got to reload the data, and then we can visualize and analyze the data. Ultimately, we have a different vision for that, and that's what you see on the right. We have incidents, we have people, we have locations, we have times. Those are categories of data. And they might be financial donors, they might be volunteers, they might be clients. They might be people that are donating blood or helping to get blood at data collection uh, centers for our blood services. But they're all people. And the more we know about how we interact with people and how we interact with people in a certain location and how we interact with people at a certain location at a certain date and time during a certain type of event, the better we can serve all of those purposes. The better we can uh, give a volunteer experience that is consistent with uh, what a volunteer these days expects. And also gives us an opportunity to serve our clients better because we understand what their relationship has been like in their community and what their relationship has been like in their community with the Red Cross in the past as well. Ultimately, being able to get our data in a, in a, a format that allows us to provide automated data analysts uh, and also storage will allow us to share with our partners better uh, and using all the tools that I talked about. You've seen a couple of these already. Uh, the shelter and, and service delivery mapping on the left. Uh, our electronic shelter registration and national sheltering system is depicted in the middle and then our partner sharing tools on the right side. Ultimately, what we're looking for is, I think Omar might be my new best friend, uh, watching his uh, lecture a little bit ago that's what we want. What we want to do is be able to take the data that we have, understand the type of event we have, uh, the amount of precipitation that's coming, uh, the previous waterfall levels and, and flooding levels in particular rivers, uh, previous um, client service data, uh, case management, damage assessment data, and ultimately our electronic shelter registrations. Their pre-disaster address tells us where damage happened. So if we're able to take all of those things and start to learn more about particular areas. We can help our emergency management partners know exactly where we need to evacuate. We can help our other operational partners and ourselves know better how to resource an operation, exactly where, exactly when, uh, and exactly with what resources. That's the vision we have for GIS, is to continue to expand and innovate and also begin to learn more about what might happen in the future before we even get there. 
Ultimately, there's a couple of reasons I wanted to show this. One of the reasons we've been able to be so successful at the Red Cross is because we have all of these parts, all of these pieces that you see here uh, working well together. Uh, so I wanted to impart that uh, to those of you who kind of sit in each of these seats in the, in the audience here. If it's not for the senior executive understanding the need and believing in these tools, they're the ones that set the priorities for the organization. They're the ones that allow the room and the headspace and the creativity to happen so that we can make these innovations happen. Uh, if they don't have buy-in, if we don't have buy-in from senior executives, this never occurs, this never starts. Champions in the organization will further the mission. They'll make sure everybody understands uh, the senior executive's vision, but also how that technology actually meets the business need. Innovators are the ones that understand the business problem, understand the technology, and are able to understand how to put those two things together and create a program uh, that allows GIS to, to help your service delivery. Super users and GIS professionals work hand in hand uh, to make the rubber meet the road. Ultimately, they're the ones that build the tools that make us all successful. Early adopters understand the vision that came from the senior executives that has been passed down through the champions and the innovators have seen the tools, believe in them, understand technology, and have a propensity to use technology enough that they're willing to take it on early, work out the bugs, be patient, and make it better. And that leads the way to the rest of the workforce. We all know if we have large workforces, some of them love technology, some of them don't want to turn a computer on. Uh, when you have a volunteer organization that's over 40,000 strong, uh, you have all walks of life, you have all ages of life, um, and you have all motivations, all types of motivations uh, for why they're with the Red Cross. You have to find a way to uh, meet their ear with the right information that helps them understand the why that makes them want to use the tools. And that's what brings me to you and the other reason I wanted to show this slide. We've talked about using each other's ideas. We've talked about best practices. We've talked about all being better uh, because of each other. That's real. That is absolutely real. Every innovation, every improvement that we make can help you. Every improvement, every new way you use a technology, every little tweak to something that makes it just a little bit better, that makes the user experience better, that makes data um, analysis better, it makes a dashboard work or is a different configuration or some weird way that we never would have thought to use that technology it makes us all better. And the reason I wanted to say that to you is because there's another reason we're all here and it's not because we want to make a lot of money. It's because we all care about the people that we work for. The people that live in your communities, the people that look for help when something happens, that are looking for assistance because they need to get back to their house or their family's been affected by a disaster or a crime or a fire or insert your industry here. They need help. We all have a unique skill set in this room and that is to put those two things together, to understand technology, to have the caring that allows you to really want to help the people that you're here to serve. You guys have a unique skill set between those two things. So I just wanted to tell you, I do really believe that we're all better together. And I urge you to continue your fight in your organizations, continue to collaborate. Um, I will be around. I'd love to talk to all of you. And we'd love to collaborate in any way we can. And thank you for your time today. Appreciate it.